Rural Heritage on RFD TV is brought to you by Rural Heritage Magazine, a bi monthly magazine featuring articles about farming and logging with draft animal power, small scale diversified family farming and homesteading, and other aspects of our rich rural heritage. Rural Heritage Magazine, borrowing from yesterday to do the work of today. For subscription information, please call 319 362 3027 or order online at www.ruralheritage.com. Hi, I'm Joe Mishka with Rural Heritage Magazine, welcoming you to another half hour of Rural Heritage on RFD TV. We visit Butterfield, Minnesota this week, where they held their 50th annual Butterfield Threshing Show. We'll see antique tractors and steam engines powering a variety of vintage farm equipment, like threshing machines, corn huskers and shellers, and grain elevators. We'll also see a number of antique machines powering lumber milling equipment like planers, shingle saws, and veneer blades. A number of old buildings stand on the grounds and house industrial steam and oil pull engines, old linotype machines and printing presses, a broom factory, and much more. A general store is packed with all kinds of household goods that were sold to farm families a hundred years ago. Next to the store is an old-time barber shop and doctor's office furnished with their tools of the trade. Throughout the day, talented locals take to the stage to entertain the crowd with gospel music. A team of percher and draft horses and a team of halflingers provide horsepower to drive a grist mill, wagon hoist, grain elevator, and corn sheller. Finally, the day includes a long parade of vintage tractors featuring Alice Chalmers this year, driven by the family members who restored them. Don't go away, there's a lot to see today on Rural Heritage on RFD TV. Steam 
pressure into either side of that cylinder. So we, we power it one direction, then we power it back the other direction. So it acts like a two cylinder. Uh, steam pressure is coming in the top. We have two intake valves, one for each cylinder, or one for each side of the cylinder, and two exhaust valves. The exhaust valves, they just open up at the correct time to let the steam out. The intake valves open up, uh, and then the, the vertical rod that you see dropping down, uh, the bottom part is what we call a dash pot. It creates, actually creates a little bit of a vacuum in there. When it comes up. When it comes up. And when the valve is released, it helps pull the valve down fast. And what they're, what they're doing, this is a, a poreless valve design. Uh, the, the governor is actually controlling when that valve closes. So, normal conditions, the rod comes over, it, it, it hooks onto the valve, and when the flywheel turns back, it pulls the valve open, and it, it keeps opening it until the governor cam has, has released it, and it's on these hooks. And when this part rides up on that cam, it opens up the valve, or opens up that mechanism, releases the valve, this pulls it down shut. And they did that for efficiency. You, you look at some of the stuff on the old engines and you say, well, that's pretty simple. You know, that's not too hard to think of, but it hadn't been done before. So, uh, and realistically, you look at some of the stuff they're doing. Yeah, it's pretty smart guys. I used to live here. Um, I had three kids when I lived here. Okay. Um, the house was just down the road, oh, as the crow flies, probably two, three miles. And uh, we were going to tear it down, and we heard they were looking for an old house. Yeah, we had three kids when we lived here. Okay. Are you Mennonite? Yes. Yourself, uh huh? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, our name is Falk. Our oldest son was born when we lived here, and this was a cold house. The curtains would blow on the windows, you know, even though the storms were high. <laughs> it was a very cold house. And it was, I mean, we le had electricity and we had running water. That house was attached to it going this way. The summer kitchen was? That summer kitchen. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. And uh, there was just a little lean to in between. You went from one to the other. And that's where I did actually my washing. And so, so you didn't use it as a summer kitchen exactly? No, so I never much. used it yeah. as a summer kitchen. That was before, before my time. Uh, yeah, I had my washer out there, but it would freeze up in the winter. Yeah, right. Sure. <laughs> you know? Sure. So, yeah, it's... And the upstairs just goes over this part of the house. I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, that isn't even safe. I mean, it's sure. very steep steps and it's right. not safe to go up there. Right. So. Yeah, I understand. I don't know if they'll ever fix it or not, but, yeah. You must be glad the house is preserved. You can come back in well, yes, see. I my girls can hardly believe that they actually lived up there. Right. It's it's just one room. Uh huh. Yeah. And they had had a bathroom put in before we bought the place. Okay. And they had it in that corner upstairs. Okay. And in the winter, the pipes the pipes were on the inside of the walls, and the pipes froze. It was a very cold house. Hard to raise little kids in. Yeah. So yes, we did not have this set up. We had a regular sink and. Uh, electric stove mm -hmm. and but they wanted to take the house back to about the turn of the century which would have been 1900 or in that area so so they wallpapered it and, and it was never painted green inside that that is originally that was like it was a built-in in, in in that time was really quite good it only the shelves are about this wide yeah. you know it's yeah. not very deep but that was a built-in is that a bread drawer down there? Is that tin in there? Um, no. I'll go open it so you can see. It almost looks like a Hoosier. It almost looks like kind of a built-in Hoosier in a way. Um, I just wonder, because you know, they'll, they'll, they'll make they'll make uh, tin or um, metal uh, bread drawers out of wood. Yeah, but they make them 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 out of wood. I would assume flour, flour and sugar. Flour, yeah, right. Flour and sugar. Sure. And 
little drawer. Didn't hold very much. Couldn't have all the stuff like we have now. Right, right. Are you making the pepper nuts in here? Yes. Yes. Right. Right. Not in here. Right. But right in here. Underneath. Okay. Sure. Yep. The corn right. cob. It's corn cob fed about a, a bushel and a half of corn cobs, and that should be a couple different. Um, I can bake up to ten loaves of bread in this oven. So you get the corn cobs burning. I get them really flamed, and there's no flame when I put the, the rack in. Does the rack sit on shelves in there? The rack sits, it sits on, on top this. of the. Oh sure, okay. So sure. that's where the rack sits. Once I get that going, and this is a stove top that you can boil water and cook things. You keep the heat from the kitchen, and so then. Um, you keep all the mess out here too, so it's nice. Keep the heat outside. Smoke. You keep the yeah that too. The ash and the dust. Yes. Um, and it, would it have back then a been a hearth like this, or did they sometimes move the cook stove they, out? They um sometimes yes, but this they sometimes use something similar to this. But yes, yeah, sometimes they would have a stove out here, and then they did their butchering and everything out here. And when they didn't have corn cobs, they would use, I, I was reading and they would use um, like um, prairie grass. Okay. It's a it's a real thick and they would tie that. Kind of rope it together and, to make it burn longer. Yep, maybe. yep. And then sometimes when they were really hard up, they used um, cow pies. Yep, dried cow pies. So, yep. sure. yep. What are you yeah. making now? I'm making cinnamon rolls. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Joe Mishka of Rural Heritage Magazine. I'm on location of one of the many events we cover that celebrates our rural heritage. If you enjoy our show, check out our magazine, where you'll learn more about the people that blend the past with what works today. You can save almost 20% off the newsstand price by subscribing at ruralheritage.com or chat with us at 877-647-2452. That's toll free, 877-647-2452. I got interested in old engines for some reason. I traveled all over the country buying them, you know, and bring, bringing them home. And I, yeah, I bought a couple up here. And then they, they built this building, because I told them I had more than I don't even see, but I, I brought them all in here then. You got more at home then, too? Oh, yeah. I got over 80 tracks. Are you are you done buying or are you still buying? Well, if I find something that's rare enough, I will. Yeah. This is a tune written by Louisa, Louisa Branscombe called Wearing the Blues.
that you put back on me It's all that I can do to carry me through While I'm wearing the blue little boy wanted to get into the puppy drawing but he knew that he had to have his parents signature because they all have to have adult signatures and so the he went and got from his grandpa the signature and he just asked grandpa to sign his name on something so grandpa did he didn't realize what the boy was doing and after the drawing we knew that he had the signature from grandpa so we gave him the puppy well on the way home the puppy started crying underneath the seat and dad said uh, uh, what's going on? And then they said, oh, go, we'll bring that back. Oh, no, that little guy said, if, if that puppy, if that doesn't go back to California, they, had, they lived in California. If that doesn't go to California, I'm not going either. He ran out in the cornfield with the dog and hid. And uh, it's about four or five hours later, all of a sudden, they found him. And then finally, Dad agreed to let him come in and let him have that puppy. It cost him extra 600 bucks to haul that puppy to California on the plane because they had flown in. And, but he says, you know, it turned out to be the best thing we ever did because that boy stayed home after school every day, played with his dogs, the neighbor kids all came over, everybody wanted to play with the dog and they were teaching him tricks and everything. He, says, he loved that dog so much he took it along to college. So uh, that turned out to be a very good story. Yeah, I've, done, I've done this barn now 38 years. So. No kidding. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a petting barn, basically. Yeah. Uh, it yeah. Just, yeah. In the, in the wintertime, they put the wings from the mill in here. Okay. So it's all closed up and everything. And so, yeah, it's used for the, But it's just for for people to come in, kids to enjoy. Parents, some of the parents don't even know what a goose is, so it's interesting. Right, right. Yeah, they don't know what a pig is and they don't know anything. And, and some of these parents and kids might live in the country, in a yeah, suburb or something, yeah. or, or even in a small town, but never really... Never really got out to touch them and play with them.
back just one more time. got your name put on a piece of paper like this. Some of these are real. Um, where is it? These are the oldest ones I have from 40s even. And then when in the fall, uh, of course groceries were so much cheaper then too, you know, so. Um, well that's, yeah. 1940s and uh, then all, also the other thing is this is where all your names were on. <laughs> I've had my good times with this store so. <laughs> Thanks for spending time with us today on Rural Heritage and RFD TV. Be sure to come back next week when we bring you more stories of people borrowing from yesterday to do the work of today. This program is available for purchase. To order your copy, please call 319-362-3027 or visit www.ruralheritage.com. Rural Heritage is a bi-monthly magazine dedicated to draft animal farming and logging as well as other aspects of our rich rural heritage. It is published by Mishka Press, which also offers a complete line of back-to-the-land books, DVDs, and calendars. Call or write for a catalog or subscription information. Or visit our website at www.ruralheritage.com.